Um, some are from our college and some are visiting our college, so please give them a warm round of applause when I finish. Oh, okay, give them a round of applause now. Yay, okay. All right, so um, I'll start with Chief Larry Walker, our college police and emergency, emergency management uh, head, Chief Walker. <laughs> Chief Walker was appointed Chief of Police here at the college in September 2001. Prior to his appointment, he began his career with the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., where he served for 21 years. During his career with the Metropolitan Police, Chief Walker served in various pet patrol, investigative, and supervisory assignments. He has served as commander of the Internal Affairs, Patrol, and Administrative Divisions. He holds a degree in criminal justice and numerous specialized law enforcement certifications. So welcome, Chief Walker. Uh, next to Chief Walker is Professor Johnny Jones, Esquire, Professor of Law in the Department of Public Safety here at Prince George's Community College. <laughs> so Dr. Jones, welcome. Uh, my colleague Dr. Jones has been a professor and has practiced law with an emphasis on criminal law for over 30 years. He's the chairman of the Maryland Ethics Commission where he handles complex public corruption complaints against elected officials and appointed American, uh, Maryland officials. He's responsible for training elected and appointed officials on Maryland's ethic laws. He also is a legal consultant and formal, former adjunct professor at the University of Maryland University College, New Mexico State University, the University of Novem New Mexico, and Albuquerque Technical Institute. Originally from the state of New Mexico, Professor Jones is a former special prosecutor who has presented felony cases to the grand jury for indictment and investigation. He was also a prosecutor who handled capital cases as an assistant district attorney, felony trial attorney. Dr. Jones was also a former acting city attorney, assistant city attorney, and municipal prosecutor, and acting city executive in New Mexico. Here in Maryland, however, Professor Jones has been active on behalf of changes in our laws regarding the death penalty. He testified before Governor Martin O'Malley's historic Maryland Commission on Capital Punishment, which was chaired by the Honorable Benjamin Civiletti, former United States Attorney General under President Jimmy Carter, in Annapolis on August 2008. On May 2013, Dr. Jones was invited by our former Governor Mo O'Malley to attend the signing of historic House Bill 276, repealing the death penalty here in Maryland. Welcome, Professor Jones. All right, and some of our external guests with us today, Mr. David Roca of the American Civil Liberties Union of Maryland. The Maryland American Civil Liberties Union, also known as ACLU, is a state affiliate of the National ACLU, which was founded in 1920. The national organization has more than two million members, activists, and supporters. Maryland ACLU was founded in 1931 with a membership of approximately 42,000. Maryland ACLU works to ensure that people in the state of Maryland are free to think and speak as they choose and can leave their lives free from discrimination and unwarranted government intrusion. It is guided by the U.S. Bill of Rights and the Maryland Declaration of Rights. The Maryland ACLU acts without partisanship to achieve these goals. David Roca is a senior staff attorney in Baltim the Baltimore office of the Maryland ACLU, where since 2001 he has worked on significant cases involving free speech, police misconduct, lesbian and gay rights, privacy, reproductive freedom, election law, among others. In 2009, the Maryland Daily Record selected Mr. Roca as one of the 10 most influential lawyers in the state. He has also served on numerous local and state commissions prior to coming to work for the ACLU of Maryland. David was a senior trial attorney in the special litigation section of the Civil Rights Division in the U.S. Department of Justice, where he specialized in investigations of and civil suits regarding police misconduct 
and conditions in prisons, jails, and state facilities for persons with developmental disabilities. David is a 1994 honors graduate of New York University School of Law. After law school, he served as a law clerk to U.S. State District Court Judge Barefoot Sanders. He's a native of Chicago, and I'm very happy to learn that he was majored in philosophy, and uh, he and his family live in Baltimore. Welcome, David. Thank you very much for being here. All right, Corey Saylor the count with the Council of American Islamic Relations, also known as CARE. CARE's mission is to enhance the understanding of Islam, to encourage dialogue, protect civil liberties, empower American Muslims, and build coalitions that promote justice and mutual understanding. CARE is a grassroots civil rights and advocacy group. It is America's, America's largest Muslim civil liberties organization with regional offices nationwide and its national headquarters is here in, on Capitol Hill in Washington. CARE's Civil Rights Department counsels, mediates, and advocates on behalf of Muslims and others who've experienced religious discrimination, defamation, or hate crimes. The department works to protect and defend the constitutional rights of American Muslims, thereby, thereby supporting the rights of all Americans. Corey Saylor is the director of the Department to Monitor and Combat Islamophobia. Okay, here we go. And last but not least, Bert, I've got you here, Bert, sorry, Bert Lopez with Maldef. Bert Mode Lopez um, and Ma is from Maldef, which stands for the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Maldef is uh, work, oh, here, I'm kind of moving here around. Sorry about this here. Do you have a copy of this? I'm sorry. I've got here, let me tell you a little bit about Mac Maldef. Maldef's significant legal victories have occurred with the Supreme Court in Texas, which struck down a law that charged tuition to children of undocumented immigrants. And another of its victories was to open the doors to students of equality. In 2006, the U.S. Supreme Court heard seven challenges to a Texas congressional redistricting plan, and only Maldef's case prevailed. Bert Lo Berth Lopez is a litigation attorney for Maldef in the southeast region, where he handles cases involving immigration, education, voting rights, political access, and employment. Maldef's Washington, D.C. office recently joined a lawsuit with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund against the administration based on voting commission. Prior to coming to Maldef, Berth was a legal services attorney for low-income DC residents at the Neighborhood Legal Services Program, working on behalf of the community, especially on issues related to access to justice in the courts. Before working at the Neighborhood Legal Services Program, Berth was a litigation associate in the office of Covington and Burlington, uh, Burlington at, in the U.S. District of Columbia, where he focused on complex litigation, white collar and criminal investigations, and federal corrupt practices. Berth is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Bayonne Law School and Magnum Cum Laude graduate of Amherst College, where he received his bachelor's in political science and Spanish. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Berth and the rest of our panels today. All right. Okay, so I'd like to get started um, by asking Professor Jones if uh, he would like to define what is racial profiling. And I understand that Professor Jones has a short video that he's going to share with us.
guys, this is Kassar and I'm Habib and you're watching Duo HK. So guys, we we're gonna do a social experiment. However, the cops came. Take a look and see what happened. did anything and neither did my partner he's asking you for your identification why i don't get it though we're just sitting here but okay there's that guy sitting over there too okay maybe we'll talk to him after we finish with you why don't okay. you go to him first i because don't see you're it. the shortest distance between the two points so can i ask you what we did i didn't say he did anything neither did my partner he asked but for why, ID. why are you being just very check... argumentative right now why, why why would you check my id though we didn't do anything he didn't do anything we're just I sitting didn't say here he did. Then why do you need to check my... Are you checking everyone's ID? Yes, everyone. Really? Yes. I don't see you checking their IDs. Well, you're pointing at nobody. Right, yeah. right there, that, there's a guy right there. Right there, you see that guy? Why don't you go check his ID? Her ID. Dude, why are you going to give us a call? No, but I, I, don't, I don't get it. Why would you check our IDs? We're just, we're sitting here. You see yeah, now? Because we got called here. Why, why did they call you? I don't know. Did I call? No. So okay. why are you giving me a hard time? Just show your ID. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you ID. Okay, so show me. Stop arguing at me. I didn't do it. you're arguing with me. I'm not arguing. I'm just asking why you want to show, see my ID for. I'm giving you my ID. I told you nothing wrong. Yeah, so they we called you. Did. So nobody you accused did. you of anything. So, so they so. called you because you don't know? So you just came here? Yeah, that's how it works. Somebody calls 911, they dispatch us to okay. a call. We'll, we'll give you our ID. Relax. Relax? It's been 10 minutes since we got here. Am, am I yelling at you? No, I'm not yelling at you. Is, is it, I'm not. Yes, you are. Well, how am I arguing with you? I'm asking you questions. I and have I the right to do so. I give you an answer, and then you keep No, arguing. you're not giving me an answer. Okay. You're not telling me why you want to see my ID. Why people, why some... Called. Okay, we I want to know. I want to know why they called on us. Like, all we did, yeah, sitting here, he, he asked the guy for a phone because we're waiting for somebody and that person is not coming. That's it. Yeah. So when I asked you what you guys are doing in the park? Sitting here waiting. What do people do in the park? There's four cops that's a little scared. I don't know if people get scared of the way it's us. I don't know. So basically, this is what he's saying. He's saying that somebody called the cops probably because we look like this. Is that what you're saying, sir? It happens a lot. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. Wow, so I can't even go to a public place wearing this. It's not the first time, third, third, third time. Let me tell you, once I went to Riverdale, right? Both of us were doing a video. They called the cops and they told us to leave the neighborhood. So this happened previously with us when we were doing a Muslim um, versus a Jewish show sort of experiment and the cops told us to leave the neighborhood. Here's the clip, take a look at it yourself. Keep Muslims out of Israel. So I should have stopped the cops when you came back. You're not, but you just, you not. this is a very sensitive area, I'm going to be honest with you, only they're going to call on you guys a hundred times. Nobody's going to take any chances, you know what I mean? Thank you. Oh my God. Good? Yeah. Alright, enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, they're following us. Yeah, they're behind us. The phone is sad, don't use that camera. Put that camera. So guys, right now these cops are still following us. This is so crazy. Like you can see the cop car behind our bear over there, and he's following us. This is so scary. Like we yeah, what the do fuck? Anything. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, we didn't do anything. We were just waiting, and we you know we were doing some social experiment. We were gonna do, and then this crazy shit happened. This is just the craziest thing. Yeah. So guys, let us know in the comments below why you think the cops stopped us. Was it because of our looks? Share this video to bring awareness. Make sure to give it a thumbs up and we'll see you every Saturday Saturday. Love you guys. So Okay, Professor Jones. Okay. Thank you. I was asked to uh, define racial profiling. I had to think about that definition. 
And I said to myself, you know, we've, all of us have our stereotypes, our biases, our prejudice, and I'm sure we have uh, had our suspicions of others based on race, ethnicity, or culture. But the problem is when you act on the target of that person of suspicion, that's where the problems uh, will begin, uh, particularly with law enforcement officers. Uh, probably one of the best, case, uh, the best definition of racial profiling is the George Zimmerman case. Do you all remember that case? And for time constraints, I'm not going to um, um, cover it, but uh, Trayvar, Trayvon Martin definitely was racially profiled. And we know the end result of what happens. So uh, there's another question in here on my belief on racial profiling. I think it should be abolished. But to give a, a, a textbook theoretical definition of racial profiling or ethnic profiling when it comes to law enforcement officers is basically the practice where law enforcement officers target people for suspicion of a crime based on their race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. Uh, the characteristics or stereotypes of a person's race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin is used as the sole or primary reason by government or law enforcement officers for making a decision um, to uh, stop an individual based on a suspicion of criminal or illegal activity. So that's the best definition that I would give uh, for racial profile. Thank you, Professor Jones. I wanted to welcome, I understand that our video feed was not working at the beginning, and I wanted to give a hello and shout out to our students and faculty and staff at our extension centers at Laurel and UTC. Hello, welcome. And also, I understand our president is here in the room, Dr. Dukes. Welcome very much. Thank you for being here. Okay. Chief Walker, can you tell me, is there a difference between the definition of racial profiling, which Professor Jones just identified in, for us, and the practice of criminal profiling? Yes, there, there is a difference, as Professor Jones and Phil just show, uh, it, clearly, it clearly depicted racial profiling, solely based on a person's race. Police officers interacted with them for no apparent reason other than their race, race ethnicity, or their national origin. In contrast, criminal profiling will deal with, criminal profiling takes into consideration a number of other factors exclusive of the race, but it's generally based on a person's behavior, their actions, their activity, and prior knowledge that the police have that some criminal activity has been committed or is about to be committed, which gives the person reasonable cause to interact with that individual. That's totally opposite of what you saw here on the film. So I'm sure Professor Jones has, has carried that over later on in some of his uh, class discussions that there is a distinct difference. Uh, one is based on behavior, the other one is based on race, national origin, or ethnicity. Thank you very much. Professor Jones, is profiling legal? That was another good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, racial profiling is illegal and unconstitutional, except at the border, border security investigations, uh, or at the border's uh, functional equivalents at airports, airways, coastlines. Uh, the New York Times had reported that the United States is uh, continuing racial and ethnic profiling in its border policy. And then national security with this anti-terrorism um, program. Uh, there's policies and executive orders from the President Obama's administration uh, at one point had prohibited racial profiling, 
uh, particularly after the Ferguson case in Missouri and also the New York City protests. Uh, but now we have a new administration and this administration, the Trump, President Trump's administration through um, Attorney General Jeff Session, they are rescinding or, or revoking many of uh, these policies that were put in place. In fact, FBI agents continue to map neighborhoods of color, of Muslim communities, and they use, the, they use this data basically to recruit informants uh, from these specific groups. So to answer the question, racial profiling, um, no, it's not legal with these exceptions. And Mr. Roca probably could uh, um, give us more uh, information on this issue because uh, ACLU are on the forefront uh, dealing with this matter. And I'm sure the ACU's position is racial profiling, all racial profiling should be illegal. Well, that's a good segue. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Roca. And thank you for sharing the mic among you. As, as the questions go down the panel, please do so. Thank you. Can you share with us what laws or constitutional amendments exist to protect individuals from being profiled? Yes. So the, the, the basis for saying that racial profiling is illegal is the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause in the U.S. Constitution and similar provisions in the Maryland Constitution and in um, almost every other state. Um, but uh, I want to say something about the Supreme Court's interpretation of the 14th Amendment and how uh, the court's interpretation has made it um, extraordinarily difficult to um, get remedies for racial profiling when it occurs. And let me step back um, uh, one moment and one small step um, backwards and um, uh, note a, a potential shade of difference um, between my view um, of racial profiling and Professor Jones, um, which may have just been um, a, a language issue, but there is, so w the way I would define racial profiling is the use of race, race, ethnicity, religion, national origin, et cetera, gender, to any degree in police activity unconnected to um, a search for a specific individual uh, suspected of having committed a specific crime. Let me unpack that for a minute. So, for example, if the police uh, get a report that says, um, someone just robbed my store, he's a white guy with curly hair, glasses, wearing a gray suit. <laughs> uh -huh. When the police go out to look for that person, it would be ridiculous if they started stopping African Americans, Asians, etc., because that wasn't the description that they had of a particular individual um, alleged or suspected to have committed a particular crime. And the reverse is true as well. Um, so the use of race in that context can't be faulted. But when police are out conducting traffic enforcement, if race, et cetera, is used to any degree, not just the sole reason or primary reason, but to any degree in deciding who to stop, that, in my view, is racial profiling, and that, in my view, is what is prohibited by the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, because by definition, when race or one of those other um, personal characteristics is being used to decide um, in the vast discretion that police officers have 
uh, about where to target their enforcement activity, then people are not being treated equally. Okay, so that's how I would define race discrimination. Uh, sorry, racial profiling, which is race discrimination. Um, and I think it is prohibited by the 14th Amendment. Now, why do I say the Supreme Court has made it um, so difficult to remedy racial profiling using the 14th Amendment? It's because the Supreme Court has said that the 14th Amendment does not simply, does not prohibit government activities that have a racially disparate impact. So according to the Supreme Court, we as a society should tolerate and be perfectly okay with uh, and, and um, accept that the Constitution does not prohibit government activities that have racially disparate effects, no matter how vast and how stark those disparities are. So for example, if you had statistics showing that in a community that was, let's say, 30% black, 90% of the people uh, stopped by the police were black, the Supreme Court says that doesn't get the plaintiff uh, anything. The plaintiff has to show discriminatory intent. That is, the plaintiff has to show that the police are making their decision, the burden is on the plaintiff to show that the motive for the uh, actions is police intentionally targeting race. So what does that mean? <laughs> there, there's a lot to say about that, but um, look, we as a society, um, we, we cannot escape the racist history of this country. That's a fact. And yet, from a legal perspective and from the Supreme Court's perspective, um, we have to pretend that none of that exists. And we have to pretend that the burden should be that when confronted with these kind of stark racial disparities, the burden should not be on the government to justify them and to say, here is the race neutral reason why this is happening. Instead, the burden is on uh, the victims of those disparities to say, um, it's not okay that we tolerate this we have to show how this is being done intentionally. But let me say one more thing. So much about the ingrained um, white supremacy in this country is not a function of um, what I would call um, overt conscious um, racism and racial animus, though there's plenty of that, and Lord knows we've seen that in um, very stark and clear terms lately. Um, but um, there is a much deeper and, and pernicious way in which it is a function of the fact that um, we as a society, frankly, just as a society as a whole, just don't give a you-know-what um, about these disparities and inequalities. And that um, toxic neglect uh, and lack of concern um, is wholly excluded from um, constitutional equal protection scrutiny because of um, the Supreme Court's decision in Washington v. Davis. I want to say um, one more quick thing about um, one other Supreme Court case that I think is also critical in, 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 in understanding the prevalence of racial profiling in policing, particularly in the traffic context, which is where it's often discussed, and that's the Supreme Court's um, uh, decision in Wren versus United States, which said 
that so-called pretext stops uh, are perfectly okay. What's a pretext stop? That's where, um, and I'm sorry, let me just step back and say, I, the, 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 the thought process that, that I think um, happens uh, in racial profiling is a background assumption that race or some other characteristic is a good proxy for criminality. In other words, the thought is, if I stop black folks, I'm more likely to find drugs. If I stop Hispanic folks, I'm more likely to find drugs. Or, um, especially beginning after 9-11, if I uh, stop folks who look Arab or Muslim, I'm more likely to catch a terrorist, right? Uh, that is the conscious or unconscious um, thought process uh, or mental process that is happening. And um, the one way in which it can be actuated um, is, look, it is almost impossible to drive down the road without committing some kind of a traffic violation. Whether you didn't come to a complete stop, you momentarily crossed the uh, uh, lane divider, uh, you're a mile an hour over the speed limit, you're too slow, your taillight is out, whatever. Um, it is pretty darn hard um, to not be committing some traffic violation. So police have this vast discretion to decide who are they going to stop. And when the thought, the mental processes that I was talking about um, are either consciously or unconsciously a factor in that decision about who to stop, um, that's racial profiling. And the way it happens is it's a pretext stop. The, the officer stops me for speeding, but the goal is not to really address my speeding. I was only going two miles an hour over the speed limit, not a big deal. The goal is to have an excuse to conduct a search of my car to know, to see whether I can, whether the officer can find contraband. And the reason that officers are able to do that is because of the Supreme Court's decision in Wren, which said, we're not going to second guess um, an officer's uh, stated reason for um, uh, making a stop as long as there's um, some reasonable basis for it, and it doesn't matter what the true reason is, and it doesn't matter um, uh, if the true reason has significant race disparities unless you can prove intentional race discrimination. So I think it's important to understand the, the legal um, construct about why this practice is, in my view, um, pervasive. Uh, and I droned on so long that I forgot exactly what the question <laughs> I was supposed to answer. I think, um, I think, you, I think you came around to was. it. I, uh, I, said, I asked uh, what amendments and laws in the Constitution protect individuals from being profiled. So uh, you did mention the 14th, the 14th Amendment. Can, can I say one other thing really quickly? Uh, sure. Yes. Um, so in Maryland, we actually have a statute that theoretically or supposedly is intended to prevent or prohibit racial profiling, but our statute is completely inadequate, and here's why. What it says is it requires every police agency to have a policy prohibiting racial profiling, but the way the statute defines it is the policy shall prohibit the practice of using an individual's race or ethnicity as the sole reason to initiate a traffic stop. But of course, that doesn't, I mean, that hardly ever happens. It isn't that a, a police officer goes out there and says, oh look, there's a black person there, I'm gonna go stop the car because there's a black person. They're not that stupid. <laughs> that isn't what happens. And so that is not a meaningful um, way to address it. I have thoughts about what would be, but I'll leave that for later. Okay, well thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, so uh, Professor Jones, uh, David 
commented a little bit about the Maryland statute um, that uh, deals with equal protection. But um, so that suggests that there are rights and protections that exist similar to the 14th Amendment um, at the Maryland level. But is this true at, at other, in other states, at other state levels? Uh, pretty, pretty, much, pretty much so. And uh, as I said, you know, the protections that we have, particularly at the, um, the state level, certainly the 14th Amendment that's incorporating the Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment against state action, and also the Fourth and Fifth Amendment um, and federal statutes at, at, um, at the federal level. And the Fourth Amendment yeah. would be? Yeah, unreasonable search and seizures, okay. uh, basically. All right, and the one other th follow-up question I wanted to ask is, so we were talking about rights and protections that exist at the state and the federal level in the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment. Are these protections that apply to both citizens as well as non-citizens? And that was another good question that I actually talked with uh, Mr. Saylor and also Mr. Lopez about. Um, and again, yes, except at the border and it's the functional equivalents, you know, airports, waterways, and coastal areas. And I know um, um, I can get into more detail, but for time constraints, you know, okay. those basic uh, uh, areas. Um, so non-citizens, yes, they, they are um, they are. They protected. are still persons, yes. as the Constitution refers to them as, right? Exactly. Yes. I just right. wanted to jump in and, uh, and say that the Equal Protection Clause does very explicitly say all persons within the jurisdiction right. of the United States. And so... Right. Um, Yes, I mean, there, there are protections for all persons mm -hmm. within the jurisdiction of the United States, whether that jurisdiction is Maryland or, and I would push back a little bit and say that with respect to the border, uh, it, the idea isn't that racial profiling is, is constitutional. I, I think that the, the, the level of scrutiny that comes into play there, there are sort of tiers of scrutiny under mm -hmm. the Equal Protection Clause, and the government must have what's called a compelling justification in, in search of a, of a uh, important or the most substantial government interest. And with respect to the control of the flow of the border, you see you have a national security interest there, which um, may, I don't want to say relax, but allow certain things that wouldn't necessarily be okay within the interior of the country. And, and I think that the courts are starting to turn even there. I mean, this idea that in, with respect to border enforcement and immigration enforcement, uh, ICE officers somehow have, or targets of, of uh, ICE investigations and actions somehow have less constitutional rights. Um, I, some of the district courts are starting to push back, uh, requiring uh, warrants and probable cause for ICE stops. Uh, we've seen a couple of cases out of uh, New York, um, and I don't remember the name of the case, but uh, this idea that somehow the Constitution applies less um, because I am, I have a different alienage or Really, at the end of the day, we're talking about perceived uh, alienage mm -hmm. because up until the point that somebody confirms your immigration status, nobody knows who you are, or where you're from, and that's the beauty of being in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to push back a little bit on uh, on that. Okay. I mean, you know, uh, I think the short answer is yes. We are all entitled to the equal protection of the laws because the Fourteenth Amendment says so. Okay. Thank you, Berth. Corey, can you, um, can you jump in about uh, your work at the Council of American Islamic Relations? Certainly issues of profiling um, are front and center in the work that you are involved in. Sure, and I also want to say thank you to everybody who's in the room and who's watching online. Uh, I, I personally always appreciate the opportunity to get outside of the Beltway, even if it is just a couple of minutes outside <laughs> of the Beltway. So. I think the thing that everybody's really seen in the news and that I'll talk about first is we've seen a significant jump in cases in the first part of this year in bias incidents that the Customs and Border Protection Agency was involved in. So no shocker there. The executive order was passed or signed into uh, action and then all of a sudden we had this jump in cases. And when I say jump in cases, we normally in a quarter see about 400 incidents that are reported to our organization that we determine have some element of religious bias in them. 
in the first quarter, so the period where the executive order was signed, we had 800 cases, and 23% of the cases that were reported to us involved Customs and Border Protection. So, to give you one example of a real human being, uh, the name Muhammad Ali might be familiar to a few people in this room. Do we know who he was? All right. Famous boxer. Uh, his son was actually stopped by Customs and Border Protection. Among the questions that he was asked is, where did you get that name? And are you a Muslim? Uh, questions that clearly infringe on his First Amendment rights. We also, from you know, the Customs and Border Protection issues are not new because of the Trump administration. We've had issues with Customs and Border Protection for years. So the other one that I want to point out to you is just to show you some of the profiling things that we're dealing with is in deposing CBP officers for a case that we're litigating, we learned that some of them had gone to a training, and in that training, they were taught to try to identify religious Muslims from cultural Muslims uh, for additional screening. And one of the ways you identify, according to this false trainer, uh, a religious Muslim is you look at the woman and see what kind of a headscarf she's wearing. If she's wearing a solid pattern head, excuse me, a solid headscarf, this indicates that she is more religious. If she's wearing a patterned headscarf, this indicates that she is more a cultural Muslim. If the headscarf is tight, this indicates religion or a cultural Muslim. If it's looser, this indicates a religious Muslim. All of that is completely false, but it is all a way for an officer to pick out who am I going to subject to additional screening based on the protected characteristics we've been talking about. Another area we've seen a jump in cases is with the FBI. And the example that I'll give to you of that is just prior to election day last year, you had Trump supporters threatening to become violent and go after people if things didn't work out the way they wanted. You had a Muslim community that was targeted by people who were going to blow them up. And you had a vague, unidentified rumor about Al-Qaeda possibly targeting an American city. And what we saw is an FBI sweep not targeting, asking people who are Trump supporters if they planned on doing anything violent or knew of violence, not targeting the people who were going after Muslims, but targeting Muslims who were just going about their business who may have had some kind of connection to Afghanistan or Pakistan. And so we saw FBI agents going to their homes and asking them questions like, are you aware of any planned uh, threat to the United States of America? So a community that once again is singled out on the very basic characteristic that if I go after Muslims, I'm more likely to get a terrorist. So that's Customs and Border Protection, the FBI. Uh, one thing that we've seen an increase in that is related but slightly different, there is a man named John Guandolo. He's a former FBI agent. He goes around the country training law enforcement uh, in his beliefs such as the odd notion that the former director of the CIA was secretly a Muslim while he was in office, that mosques are barracks and training centers, that mosques do not deserve First Amendment protections, and that Muslim cab drivers and hotel workers are getting jobs near airports for nefarious reasons. So these very odd conspiracy theories were endorsed by the National Sheriff's Association in late 2016. He got a letter from that entity saying his training was great and that people should attend it. And that endorsement, which is deeply concerning, I think, to anyone, when you recognize that that means officers will get bad training and therefore any interaction with a Muslim starts from a negative place, that endorsement was not pulled until Mr. Guandolo was accused of assaulting a sheriff during a training in Arizona. The last thing that I want to point out as something that we've seen a rise in that is potentially good news is on watch listing activities. I, I think anybody who's followed the watch list for years where you're put on either no fly or selectee, which means you get additional scrutiny at the airport, on watch listing, most of us that have followed it for years are pretty clear on the fact that most of the people on the watch list are Muslims. And once you're on, you can be nominated to that list through a process in which you're not really able to review and challenge. And being on that list, you have no real, real way to challenge your designation. We recently got the ability in one of our lawsuits 
to actually subpoena the government on some of the issues around the watch list. So I do, I did want to put in that last thing is something that mm -hmm. we've seen widespread against the Muslim community where we are finally getting the opportunity to perhaps challenge the government on some of these additions of people to this list and nobody knows why they were added and there's a lot of confusion about it. Just to give you one example of a person who was on the watch list at first, you may have heard of him, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he may or may not have won a Nobel Peace Prize at one point, yet he was on the <coughs> list and it required a phone call to then Secretary of State Rice to get him off of the list. So when I say the nominations to this list are somewhat arcane, those are the kind of people that are ending up there, but at least finally we're able to challenge it. Thank you. I just want to jump in and say that... I'm going to actually ask oh. you, Berth, because I did such a uh, jumbled job of introducing you and the work at uh, MALDEF, if you would, first of all, give us a little background about <coughs> MALDEF and some of the work that you're doing. Sure. Um, well, MALDEF is a Mexican-American legal defense and educational fund. It's uh, founded in 1968. It's uh, the uh, oldest Latino civil rights law firm in the uh, country, and uh, we're often known as the uh, law firm of the Latino community. Uh, we work uh, primarily through impact litigation in the areas of uh, immigration, uh, voting rights and political access, education, and, uh, oh, and employment. Um, and uh, the work that I specifically have done at MALDEF in the last uh, two years has been this interesting cross-section of uh, immigration and education, uh, specifically with respect to the rights of DACA holders. Um, we're in the state of Georgia right now. Uh, Essentially, we had to sue the state of Georgia for access to uh, in-state tuition for DACA holders. Um, not only uh, access in-state tuition, but Georgia has decided that if you uh, are a DACA holder, you um, are not lawfully present in the United States for the purposes of admission to their top schools. So we represent a young man who is, uh, wanted to go to one of Georgia's uh, three or four top schools and instead ended up at Dartmouth when he couldn't even apply. Um, so we are, uh, I think, at the forefront of the, these issues that touch on immigration and education, but just immigrants in general. Um, and with respect to uh, the situation now with uh, DREAMers, we are um, not only in litigation, but also on the policy front advocating for uh, immigration reform that uh, plugs the the gap that has been created through the administration's reckless um, ending of the uh, DACA program. Um, I wanted to sort of touch on something you said about um, profiling and um, transparency, right? I mean, I, th I think the issue is, uh, there are a lot of issues with it, but if you notice that, like with racial profiling, where you, where you have an arrest stop, you don't know what's really going on in an officer's mind, you get a very similar parallel to trying to get information on how to get on the watch list. It's, it's a black box and you, and you can't see it. The government really should work best when we all understand the inner workings of it. Um, this idea that you can hide the, the, the reason why I've pulled somebody over and, and make something up, but and, oh no, it wasn't because you're, you're black or Latino, it's because you, you were going one mile over the speed limit or, or the idea that um, I'm going to tell you, um, I'm not going to tell you why you're on the watch list, but somebody gave us a sort of credible threat and we're following up on it. I mean, you can even sort of see it in the, in the video that we watched where uh, the young man is asking the police officer, why, why have you pulled me over? Why are you asking for my ID? And there's no, there's no answer to it. It's just, a, it's because we say so. And I think that a lot of this work is getting to that very underlying idea that we are as citizens and as members of this society entitled to know um, why the rules that are being applied to us are being applied to us. All right, thank you. Chief Walker, I'm going to get your uh, perspective on this and ask you to jump in. Um, as a member of law enforcement, um, what, what are we as citizens and non-citizens required to say and do if stopped by law enforcement, whether it be the police or um, border Patrol or, you know, what have you. What are we required to do? What, what, what should we do and what don't we have to do? Well, there, 
In a couple of circumstances, uh, it, I'll refer back to the video where there was a contact with police where the person was a pedestrian. Uh, he, in my opinion, the gentleman did everything that they were supposed to do. They asked the proper questions. They maintained their, uh, their attitude toward the officers. As you saw, the officer lost control. But everything that that person did, he was entitled to do. Why was I stopped? What was the reason? What was the suspicion? As you saw as it went on, the individual <coughs> officer had no explanation. Uh, so you have the right to ask questions. You have that right to ask why you were stopped. You have the right for an explanation as to what call prompted that. Oftentimes we say we got a call, but we have, that's as far as we go. And when there are no more answers, that generally as you see what happened, the officer takes a defensive position. So everything they did in that situation was right. That was a pedestrian stop. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about operating a vehicle on a public highway, it changes a little bit in the sense that you should produce your driver's license, registration, insurance. You should question why the officer stopped you. Uh, you should ask if you're free to go. And quite honestly, to, to, to keep from raising the situation, and I'm not defending anyone, but I'm just saying common sense, is until that interview gets to an accusatory stage, uh, you should have a conversation with the officer, but as soon as he accuses you and questions you about some illegal activity, uh, you have the right to stop. You don't have to talk to him anymore. You can request a lawyer. Uh, you can request his identification. You can uh, document that information, whether it's by your cell phone or by another person in the car, but you have every right to respectfully request uh, why that information is being requested, why you're being stopped. And we talk about the pretext and I think all of us are familiar with it, but we also have to understand that when uh, governments pass laws to make it legal to stop for certain violations, one of the biggest things, in, I, I guess you would say in Maryland, is the seatbelt. Well, let's look at how this plays out. The majority of people that generally do not use a seatbelt are young, younger males. So if you are targeting, the, the targeting younger males because you know the chances are that they don't have a seatbelt on, then chances are one out of every two you stop is going to be not wearing a seatbelt. But that goes back to the comment that David made about the pretext. And if I want to stop a vehicle, give me about five minutes. You're going to not turn on your signal light. You're going to change lanes. And you know, police officers can be real creative, let's be honest about it. Every time they pass a law, they'll come up with some other way to articulate why they stopped that individual. So it's an ongoing process. So those are the types of things that uh, you need to be aware of, and you need to be aware of the fact that any little thing can cause an officer to stop you because they're usually, it's not hard to find some legal reason for doing it. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Chief Walker. Um, I want to also give an opportunity to the audience and students to be able, and faculty and staff who are here to be able to have a chance to answer questions. So um, I'm going to um, ask if people are interested in coming down and asking questions. We'd like to go ahead and open it up. Um, what I would like to do, though, while people are thinking of questions, is ask the panelists as a whole is, um, Chief Walker has given us some ideas of what, it, what is appropriate and what we can't do. But of course, we all have seen numerous incidents on social media and ones that have been taped where individuals are pulled over and asked for IDs and things just don't turn out well. They turn dangerously uh, bad and uh, individuals can be harmed and killed. What would you recommend um, in your relations with your clients and advising members of the public students, faculty, and staff here at our college, what we can do to protect ourselves from incidents of profiling. Anyone on the panel? Well, I'm going to, I get this question asked a lot by students, and I let the experts jump in. But I think one thing that we need to do is 
Can you speak into the mic, yeah, Professor? Certainly, Jones? if you can videotape or record the incident, that would be great. I mean, with the technology that we have today, that has uh, uh, reduced a lot of problems, uh, particularly when I was, uh, that I can see since I've been uh, worked at the uh, DA's office. But I said one major thing is to submit. You know, submit. Don't fight back. Submit. And I'm not sure, I'm sure the ACLU may disagree. Uh, but this is for your own protection. Um, and I'll let the other panels jump in. Do your fighting in court. That's where it's okay. done. David? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a pres pr prescriptive um, approach to this because, look, my interaction with a police officer is very likely to be different than Professor Jones' interaction with a police officer, and perhaps even more likely to be different than some of the young black men and black women in this auditorium's interaction with the police officer. And so that has to be sort of stated and acknowledged at the outset. And so this is a personal decision. I think we can talk about what rights we have as um, residents in the U.S., but um, as I think the professor was alluding to, when push comes to shove on the street, it's you and a officer who has a badge, a gun, and handcuffs. And um, the reality is the person with the badge, the gun, and the handcuffs is more likely if there is um, an altercation uh, to have uh, the better end of the outcome. And so this is a deeply personal decision that people have to make about to what degree is it important to you to stand up for your rights uh, and to what degree is it important to you to walk away from the encounter a free man or a free woman. Um, and I can't answer that question for any of you. Um, we can help you understand what your rights are, and the ACLU of Maryland has um, a very extensive now Know Your Rights training program with trainers all over the state, and we work to train trainers who are not ACLU lawyers. They're, um, some of them are lawyers, but some of them are just, some of them are former clients, everyday folks. Um, and we try to uh, do those in as many um, places and opportunities as we can to help people understand what your rights are. And part of that training is helping people to understand what can be an effective way to try to assert your rights. Um, I mean, the truth is, look, we, the police officers have to have a certain level of um, suspicion in order to lawfully stop us. But we have no way of knowing what level of suspicion they have. We have no way of knowing what's in their head. We have no way of knowing or even um, uh, conclusively ascertaining at the scene whether their assumption about whether they have the necessary level of suspicion is correct. And as the professor says, all of that really can only be effectively adjudicated after the fact in a court if it gets to that point. But there are ways to try to um, um, prompt officers to confront for themselves uh, where in the Fourth Amendment hierarchy, that is, what kind of an interaction are they having with you as a civilian, and to think about, do they have the necessary level of legal justification to do what they're doing? And one of the best ways to do that is to say, uh, am I being detained or am I free to go? We call those magic words. Am I being detained or am I free to go? And I'm not going to try and do our whole Know Your Rights <laughs> training now. But uh, there's that kind of, um, I think that kind of training can be very helpful in um, giving you at least the possibility of some measure of control over this police civilian interaction. In the end, frankly, you don't have control because it's the officer who has the gun, the badge, and the handcuffs. And if they want to detain you, if they want to arrest you, 
they're going to do it whether they're right or not. And then it's after the fact um, that you can adjudicate it. And it's certainly true, I mean, physical resistance is not um, likely to end well um, for the person who isn't an officer. Okay. Do you remember the tennis player that was in New York, right. in New York yes. City? Yeah. And uh, didn't have time to <laughs> right. basically uh, interact. It was thrown to the ground. Right. And, uh, but I think he did the right thing as far as uh, just submit because uh, it could be it could have resulted in a, a tragedy. I'm going to say this real quick because we have some folks right. waiting to ask questions. But a couple of things that I would add to that. <clears throat> what I was taught is after, the inc after whatever the incident is, the first thing you should do is go somewhere, sit down, and write down everything. Everything you can remember. So while things are happening, try to get badges, names, numbers. But what, it's very, very important to write everything that you can remember down. This includes what kind of clothing the people were wearing, any detail. And the reason I was told you do that is 10 months later when this ends up in court, the officers will have notes that they took afterward. And if you didn't take your own set of notes, it's your word versus their word, and you don't remember because it was 10 months ago. So that is a very, very important thing to do. I would also always remind people, the one thing that gets lost among the technical details of how you deal with it is the very human reaction you have in these moments. Your system is flooded with adrenaline. You are very nervous. There are people who have a lot of power standing around you. So that has to be factored into your decision. So the TSA asks you for your cell phone. You actually are required to give it to them. Then they say, unlock it for me. You're not required to do that. And then you go, sir, I'm not required to do that, so I'm not going to do it. Well, now you're more than likely going to miss your flight. Now you have a lot of people asking you questions that are making you nervous. So just keep that in mind, and Chief Walker alluded to the key thing that comes out of this, you must keep yourself as calm as possible. Losing your self-control is one of the first ways to walk yourself down a wrong path. I was going to add, oh, just, gonna just add. piggyback on that, I mean, the, the writing something down, especially if you're upset, um, you know, you are going to see this 10 months, a year later, and the police officer will have their notes. Um, there's a question about admissibility of your excited utterance, right, if you write it down, and not to bore you all with it, but essentially um, your own words are going to be more reliable if it happens right after the fact where your adrenaline's pumping. The courts sort of presume that those types of statements are more credible, and so you're doing yourself a, a favor. Um, and, and then the other thing is, um, you know, I think you have resources in this day and age. You call MALDEF, call the ACLU, call um, you know somebody. Uh, you don't have to go through this alone. And I mean, there are advocates out here who um, you know who really care about these issues and and are, are willing to push back. Thank you. And you all have materials out outside that people can pick up as they leave. So I'm going to open it up to questions, sir. I've seen, I've heard a number of stories about airlines, and I understand that the captain has the ultimate authority, but if you come on the airplane and you're wearing Muslim gear, or you have a Quran in your hand, a steward is season, can the captain say, this plane does not take off? Or can the captain order authorities to remove that person in Muslim attire off the plane? I'd rather defer to a lawyer on that one. <laughs> Um, I came to the ACLU of Maryland um, shortly after 9-11. Um, I came to the ACLU uh, in October of 2001. And the first um, case that I worked on at the ACLU of Maryland was a lawsuit against American Airlines on behalf of Hassan uh, Sater, um, who was kicked off of a flight uh, because the stewardess, well, because a fellow passenger told the stewardess she was uncomfortable with him based on nothing other than the fact that he looked Arab. Um, uh, and there were lots of cases like that. There were quite a few lawsuits filed um, 
there were uh, mixed results in the cases. Um, but the short answer to your question is, do I think it's legal to kick someone off a flight because they are, because they appear Muslim, Arab, what have you? No. Um, has it happened? Yes. Um, have courts uh, imposed remedies? Sometimes. Does the um, uh, captain have the power to, to do it in the sense of saying this flight isn't going anywhere? I mean, yes, in the sense that that person will get kicked off the flight, um, but that doesn't make it legal. Um, so if it happens, uh, again, there isn't something that you can do um, in the moment, um, but that is the kind of thing that ought to be uh, reported to organizations like CARE, MALDEF, ACLU, et cetera, that care about it um, and that may be able to do something about it. Okay. But it's only after the fact. Right. That sounds like a kind of a textbook definition of the profiling that you talked about yes. at the beginning of the <laughs> thing. Okay, sir. Okay, uh, my question is, it's about, um, we talking about several angles of talking about the laws, we talking about the amendments, we talking about constitutional rights, and we know all these different rights that we have as individual citizens. But my question is, has there been an approach from DOJ and the uh, Sheriff's Committees of America or uh, whatever about uh, these, I'm talking about in the, in the realm of officers who take advantage of citizens' rights at the moment, where they might be overreacting, they might be a little bit heated, and they not knowing what their rights are as an officer to charge a person. And these individuals that end up on the police force, what is the Department of Justice doing and police networks doing to, to stop uh, these type of officers of getting on the force. I, I mean, I'm not saying the laws that we got in the United States are not good laws. We got some great laws here in the United States, and we got people that's taking advantage of them for their own personal cause, religious reason, whatever. But what is, is in the system to try to improve the selection of officers that we do put on our forces? That's to all of you. You know, I, I think generally the Department of Justice, local police association, national police associations have put things in place or policies in place to prohibit or prevent that. However, as you were alluding to, that's all well and good. We can have rules, we can have policies, we can have things in place, but how do you make sure that people are adhering to it? How do you make sure that the person that you're selecting doesn't have that hidden agenda or that hidden bias. So when we start talking about the caliber of people that we have, or the caliber of people that we hire, our screening processes have to get much higher, have to get much better. Not only that, the police officials within the system have to get better. They have to scrutinize, flag these people, and address these issues. The worst thing that can happen, and I'm, you, you've seen it, and just to be honest about it, um, we can have all the rules that we want, but if the system turns an eye and condones it, but we are following all the rules, and we know that people have biases, we know they have preconceived notions about how people are. So it not only, you can't legislate bias, I guess. You can't, you can't legislate somebody doing the right thing. So you really have to spend a lot of time deciding what type of person you want to be a police officer what type of person do you want enforcing these laws? And do they understand the diversity? Do they understand how other people react, how they are unknowingly uh, using bias against a person? Most, a lot of people don't know it. These things are built within them as they grow up through their lifetime span, and they are not even conscious of a lot of things that they may do. So it has to be a bigger effort on everyone, not only the rules, not only the regulations, but the, the leadership has to take an active role in making sure that you identify and weed those people out that are using those biases uh, against the law. Go ahead and, and just add to that that 
You know, the leadership is absolutely important, and I think one of the things that's been most disappointing about this Justice Department is its uh, reprehensible approach to the support of the pardon of, of Joseph Arpaio, who was, cool. by the previous Justice Department, brought up on charges of contempt of a court order to not racially profile Latinos in Maricopa County. And so to the extent that we have the Justice Department now supporting uh, an effort to essentially drop his case, I think, is is shameful, and it's an indication that uh, you know elections matter and leadership matters. And um, just wanted to go ahead and vent that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question sure. for one of our viewers at our university town center. What are our rights as observers of a stop? Um, that's an issue that uh, the ACLU has um, litigated both here in Maryland and around the country. Uh, and as long as you are not interfering um, with whatever it is that the officers are doing, if you are a third party observer, you have the right to observe uh, what is happening. You have a right to record uh, what is happening. Um, and uh, for those who are comfortable doing that, I endorse um, very heartily um, the recommendation that you do that, whether you are a third party observer or whether it's your own stop. We've litigated both, and it's crystal clear that you have a, um, a right, a First Amendment right uh, to do that, and in fact, the ACLU um, has created an app um, specifically for that, uh, we call it our mobile justice app, and the one potential advantage of using the app is that it um, contemporaneously sends a copy of what you're recording to an ACLU server so that even if the police seize your phone and delete the recording, which we have seen happen and which we have litigated here in Maryland, uh, there is still, a recording will still exist because it has been, it has been uploaded um, to a server. Um, so, but you don't have to use the ACLU app. There's many apps that do that, um, but you certainly have a right to do it, and if you feel comfortable doing it, um, you should do it. I, I have to note that there are still, although your legal right to do so is clear, there are police officers who don't like it uh, when you do that, um, and so I don't want to, again, be naive and pretend that in doing that, um, there isn't some risk that an officer will react negatively. Um, again, this is a personal decision that people have to make. Um, but there are tools out there. You have a right to do it, um, and there are tools out there to help you do it in ways that can protect you from retaliation by officers. Thank you. We'll go over to this side. Um, I have two questions. One, is citizen's arrest still a thing? And two, at one point during racial profiling or something like that, when does that become appropriate? When is it okay for the person to react without getting into some kind of trouble of their own? You mean a, a, a civilian arresting a police officer? Mm -hmm. um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Um, uh, um, I, I would not suggest that. Um, uh, I mean, even if we could have some theoretical discussion about whether racial profiling is a crime, it could be, but even that is debatable. But let's say even we assume that, again, the police officer has handcuffs and a gun. You don't engaging in a physical confrontation with them, which is what any arrest is. I mean, what is an arrest? An arrest is the power that the state gives to a police officer to forcibly, by force, detain you and take you somewhere. It is, it is an act of force. Um, and I, I can't recommend doing that to someone who has handcuffs and a gun. Now. You had a separate question, which is, is uh, um, 
uh, citizen arrest a thing? The answer is, weirdly, in Maryland, it is still a thing. And in fact, since we're on the topic of racial profiling, there was um, a fairly notorious case in Baltimore County where someone who was an auxiliary police officer, meaning not a police officer, um, a civilian in one of these I don't know what to call it. Helpers. Huh? Helpers. Yeah. Um, uh, very flagrantly um, and improperly arrested uh, a college student in Towson um, in what I think was a very clear example of both racial profiling and excessive force. And when I went to research it, I found to my surprise that Maryland still has this common law um, power of um, uh, civilian arrest. It's weird. I don't think it should exist. <laughs> um, but that's also slightly different than your question about whether we as civilians can, can exercise some personal authority to arrest cops who are acting badly. I, unfortunately, I don't think that's the, the solution. Thank you. And I would encourage you to, if you do see uh, practices uh, by the police follow internal complaint yes again we're talking about records making a record follow an internal complaint and uh, i've had some students say well what good is that going to do well you're providing statistics and this is very important because under section 14141 of the 1994 violent crime control acts again the justice department can basically bring a suit against the law enforcement um, office for a pattern and practice um, of abuse of citizens. At least they'll be able to conduct that investigation. So file an internal complaint. It's very, very important. Okay. Thank you, Professor Jones. Okay, we'll take a question over here. We've got yes, time I, for just a few more. Great. Yes, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the panel for coming today. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my question is going to be kind of a little strange to you, I'm sure. Um, with Hurricane uh, Harvey and with Irma right now, uh, I know you noticed that the news media is promoting the looting. Uh, my problem is, is um, who's going to, or have you all in your capacities put it out that we can help the people who are gonna need help? Because right now, the people who are looting, I'm not sure why they're doing it. I'm not sure if they even know, if they'll even find the people for sure that do it. But, in the circumstances where everybody was flooded out, in the circumstances where people have lost everything, um, who's going to defend them and will they have your, uh, somebody on the ground from you besides FEMA and the police and everybody else, will you all be there to help those people? So I don't know if I can fully address your question, but what I can say is that CARE has off four offices in Florida and also we're in Houston. So our offices there have actually been involved in relief efforts, helping to make sure that mosques are open to take people in. And because we have attorneys on those staffs, if something, if an issue comes up where we believe that somebody in the aftermath of the hurricane was singled out for purposes of their religion, then certainly we're there to help them out. I'm just trying to come up with a scenario where that would happen. I don't see it immediately. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, Adon. In terms of activism, what can we as civilians do to not only ensure that we're raising awareness of these issues, but also moving closer to the eradication of these issues? I'll be greedy and just take the mic on that. Uh, I would just, the first thing that I would absolutely suggest is you have three institutions right here that are always in need of interns. And a great thing to do while you're in college, uh, contact MALDEF, contact the ACLU, the Maryland office, not the DC legislative office since that's what's here. Uh, contact CARE, we need that kind of help. We really want it. And just a general piece of advice, if you have concerns about these issues and you want to do something about it, don't just sit at your dinner table and talk about it. Join one of these organizations and follow our mailing list because we will often ask you to do something. I know from CARE, usually it's as simple as call your congressperson. Uh, your voice alone at the dinner table is important. Your voice as part of a movement 
that's all making phone calls can have significant change and impact. And then also since you're in college right now, we really, <clears throat> I know we always need more lawyers, we always need more journalists, we need people who are involved in the public sector who are concerned about these issues and therefore will be advocating about them from inside different institutions. Um, I agree with everything uh, Corey said. I want to uh, add a couple other things. Um, the, these practices are deeply entrenched both in this country as a whole um, and in police departments um, in particular. Uh, and they are not um, litigation by itself is not going to fix it. Laws by themselves are not going to fix it. Um, there needs to be, um, if, if these things are going to change, it will be both part of a larger societal change, but also it will happen because of political pressure, because politicians uh, who appoint police chiefs feel that they are going to get in trouble unless uh, behavior changes. And so one of the things um, uh, Berth uh, referred to um, transparency as being important, and I agree with that. And one of the ways that the ACLU has tried to um, empower all of us to deal with these issues is by trying to make information about police behavior public. Um, so there is a deeply flawed and yet better than nothing um, statute in Maryland that requires every police agency in the state to report information about um, their traffic stops and uh, demographic information and about what happens after the stop. Now, I came here prepared to talk about all the flaws in that legislation, and believe me, there are many. Um, but because of that law, which we got passed, um, uh, a group that we worked with called the Southern Coalition for Civil Rights um, got the raw data and now has it up on the web um, at a website called openpolicing.org, and you can pull up the statistics, for example, for the Prince George's County Police, and you can see what the race disparities are in stops, in searches, in what things lead to a search, and the disparities are stark. Um, so I encourage you to look at that data, and if it bothers you, as I hope that it will, um, then work with groups here in Prince George's County to say this kind of crap has to stop. You said what website again? Uh, open data um, policing. Openpolicing.org is what you said. I yes. don't know if that's... Let me make sure I said open, sorry, opendatapolicing.com. Sorry, opendatapolicing.com. Um, uh, and there's... Uh, specific data there, and as, as Corey said, you can work with the ACLU and other organizations to reform that data collection law to make it better. Um, there are all kinds of things that need to also change in terms of state law um, to combat this, um, and you can work with groups like the ACLU and others to change that, but it's important to also work locally. Um, uh, and there are groups here in Prince George's County, the Prince George's People's Coalition, for example, uh, has been uh, focused on these kinds of issues locally here in Prince George's County for a long time. There are, and I'm not saying that's the only one, um, CASA. Uh, so there are many groups, many opportunities, many places for your um, activism, uh, and that's, that's what's needed. Thank you. One, one more follow-up question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here, and then we'll see if we have a moment. Yes. We'll be here after. Yeah. Hi. Um, 
While I realize that as a citizen, I'm endowed with particular rights that protect me, so do other citizens, but it's become clear that we live under this administration that disregards justice, disregards equity, you know, with the recent DACA, and then also our president pardoning someone that is almost a prolific racial profiler. What power do citizens really have, and what can I personally offer to people in that are similarly minorities? How can I offer them any consolation to, to make them feel safer? How do I feel safer as well? I mean, I think, You know, I think the biggest responsibility that we have as citizens is to exercise our franchise to vote. And so wherever you have an opportunity to vote on an issue of, of justice, you, you exercise it. And we just learned, um, you know, last year that uh, elections matter, right? And issues matter. And um, you have the, you know, phone number, or you can find the phone number to your your uh, delegate or your senator, your representative, you pick up the phone and you, you know, exercise your right and uh, they, you know, they listen. When they get a flood of phone calls, um, they certainly will listen to concerns of their constituents. Um, you know, with respect to how do you best become an ally uh, to an individual person, I think it's, you know, it's upon you to, to educate yourself about the issues that people face and, um, you know, there's a human touch to it. How, how would you want somebody to, to treat you, right? Um, and, and this just sort of goes to the, the idea that Mr. Rocha was articulating before that no set of laws, no set of, of measure, of legal measures, litigation, are going to change what's in people's hearts, right? And, 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 um, but I think it's important that we as advocates in the community outside of the courts push these types of changes, push awareness, and that starts, you know, on the level of the most basic human interaction. Well, on that very uplifting and uh, positive note, thank you both very much. And I'm going to bring Paulette up here to this podium. So I want to, um, on behalf of the Division of um, Student Affairs, I'd like to thank everyone who um, attended this event, both here in person and those who are watching the live stream at our University Town Center and the Laurel College Center. Again, this event was hosted in recognition of um, Constitutional Day. We do have another event tomorrow that will be um, on the rights of immigrants, another panel discussion, and that will be held at the Laurel College Center from 12 to 1.30 p.m. and will be live streamed here on the Largo campus, and it will be upstairs on the second floor in conference room two, and also it will be live streamed at the University um, Town Center in room 171. I'd like to just um, give a round of applause to our panelists for a wonderful job. It's a very informative session, very relevant to what's happening um, in our communities. I'd like to give a special thanks to also to our moderator, um, Dr. Fredericks. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank our video system services staff um, for the work they've done in making the live streaming um, possible, as well as our AV staff. And I would like to, um, I have a small gift um, for our panelists, and Dr. Frederick, I have your gift in my office. But I'd like to thank um, Ms. Um, Professor Jones, um, our professor here at the college. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Mr. Corey Saylor from the Council of American Islamic Relations. And um, Mr. Bert Lopez from the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. David Roca from uh, 
the American Civil Liberties uh, Union. And our very own, the Chief Walker. And I'd like to also, in closing, just to thank um, some key departments within the Division of Student Affairs, Enrollment Services, um, Financial Aid, Enrollment Services, they purchase those constitutional guides and those Know, know Your Rights pamphlets, so we do like to thank them. After immediately following, we have refreshment in food. And I did want to acknowledge that we, uh, some of our attendees had to leave because students have to go to class and in between classes, and it's not because they're not really interested in the topic. But again, once again, I'll, on behalf of Prince George's Community College, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and the moderator and you, the attendees, for participating in this event. And thank you. Make sure you fill out those evaluation forms. We'd like to get feedback. And just to drop, just leave those on the tables on the way out. And it's um, front and back.